Happy to be here today and uh, to talk a little bit about, I thought we'd focus a little bit more on the Jaljeevan mission. You know, one of the, I think, the stellar accomplishments in, uh, in India over the last 10 years has been, I think, the actual delivery on the ground of many large-scale transformational programs. I'm talking of welfare programs. Whether you look at water or you look at uh, you know, financial inclusion, health. But I think there's been uh, grounding of programs on a scale which we have not seen before. And there are many reasons for that. There are a lot of focus, a lot of uh, sort of political leadership uh, for these programs. In fact, one of the lessons we learned from the Swaj Bharat mission, so I was secretary in the ministry from, for four and a half years, from 16 to 20. And w many people were wondering how did India actually take, if you talk of sanitation briefly, uh, coverage from about 38, 39% which had been more or less stagnant there to, you know, to full scale in a short period of five years. So very challenging. And uh, you know, people were sort of fundamentally, they thought, listen, how do you do it? It's impossible, right? How do, you, how do you do that? Because the scale of working in India, as all of you know, but globally, people are always amazed at the scale of India. It's difficult. And there were four lessons we learned from this. So I thought I would straight away share those, the four Ps we called it. Uh, we shared these four Ps with, uh, at an international conference in 2018, when we had the Secretary General of the UN on his first visit to India. So the Prime Minister was keen to share these experiences with other countries on how do you scale up sanitation. So we organized this in October 18. And it was called the Mahatma Gandhi International Conference on Sanitation. We had uh, 55 health ministers from around the world who were all keen on understanding you know, what has changed. But at the Delhi Declaration, we called it, uh, we had the four Ps. Um, the, so the first P was political leadership. We had very strong uh, support. The second P was public financing. It became important to understand that for a public good like sanitation, right? And you know, you can get into the definition of what is a public good. And today in the World Bank, we're talking of global public goods. And uh, with the new president, with Ajay Banga taking over in the bank, global public goods have become very important. But sanitation, why is it a public good? Because if you take a rural uh, a village, if half the households have toilets and are using them, and the other half are defecating in the open, then they are polluting the, the soil, the water, and when flies carry the parasites from the excreta back to the people who are using toilets, it's affecting everyone. So sanitation, it's important for the whole village to become open defecation free, so it's a public good. And the economics of the lack of sanitation have been well documented. So there was a, a World Bank report in 2006 which found that the lack of sanitation in India is costing us up to 6% of GDP. So it's got an economic uh, uh, sort of externality as well. So public financing for a public good. Now there are many countries around the world, and I worked in many of them, and in Africa in particular, they're saying, listen, why should we invest in sanitation? They want to invest more in water, I'll come to water. Because water, everyone demands water. There's not really much, you've got to stimulate demand for sanitation. So you need to, it's a public good, you need to put in public resources. But if you're a finance minister and you have got competing demands for scarce resources, where are you going to put your money? So the government decided, and there was a lot of evidence which showed, and for a research organization like, you know, there are studies which show that the return on investing in sanitation is four or five is to one, right? There are big returns. Now, but many finance ministers are not impressed, but in India, Having decided that there was a political imperative to scale up sanitation, the government decided to invest in it. So over the Swaj Bharat period of five years, more than $20 billion, 1.2 lakh, were invested, center and state together, in sanitation. So that's something which no one understands. 
And many countries are reluctant to invest. So if you're a finance minister, you might want to focus on infrastructure, on health, maybe even education, sanitation. You know, that's not a subject people talk about. So second P, first was political leadership. Second P was public financing. The third was partnerships, because this was not meant to be a Sarkari program. And so it became important to involve everyone, right? Whether it was panchayats or NGOs or development partners. So that was, the and the fourth was people's participation what we were discussing. Unless you get the people involved and taking charge, it's going to be difficult to sustain. So, so those were the four Ps coming out of the Swaj Bharat mission. I mean, there are many stories about that program. Look, but you need to keep working at it. And sustaining change is very difficult. And so you can never stop, right? And people will say, oh, this, you know, this village claimed it's open defecation free, but people are still, it will keep happening. So, uh, the program, then we started Swaj Bharat phase two, which is how do you sustain the gains of this and how do you sustain that behavior change? Because this program was mainly about changing behavior. 110 million toilets were built, 11 crore, and most of them are being used, but still it was important to sustain it. So behavior change was at the heart of this. And so that was some of the lessons we learned in the, on how do you sort of, so if you can align the four Ps, it becomes that much easier. It's a very complex program and it's never easy in a large country like India, which has got many states and, and a lot of diversity. So in that Swaj Bharat mission, it became very, very important to work with the states. And so our job was you know, going out to states, engaging at the political level, at the civil service level, and getting the young collectors and CEOs excited about the program and making it a priority for them. Because at the district level, as all of you know, people are doing 100 different programs. How do you focus? What is priority? It depends on what the chief minister wants, what the government of India wants. So it was galvanizing the 700 districts. And actually, uh, I'm from the UP card of the IAS, and we have got a saying there that there are only three positions in India which really matter, PM, CM, and DM, right? If you can align the three, you can get lots of things done. So we tried to align those, and to a large extent it worked. So the, the design and the implementation of programs, uh, particularly at scale in a country like India, requires a lot of effort and a lot of partnership between the center, the state, and local, and all the way down to the panchayat. So if you can align them, get them all interested, incentivized to deliver, it becomes that much easier. So it's a combination of leadership, of partnership, of recognition, and you know, it's, you've got to be at it pretty much 24 seven. So it was an exciting time uh, to work between 16 and 20, and it continues, it doesn't stop, right? You cannot stop at that. So on the, that's sort of the Swaj Bharat story in a nutshell. I've got a case study on that, by the way. I've, I taught this course in IIM Ahmedabad. So there's a three part case study on the Swaj Bharat mission, it should be available somewhere. I've sent it to you, you can use it. Uh, and there's also a teaching note if anyone wants to teach it. That gives a sense of how this program was done. Water. You know, so I've been working on water for, I don't know, 30 years. Right? I started out in UP when I was a project director of a project called Swajal. And Swajal, the name is very interesting. A lot of the World Bank project would have names. So this project officially in the World Bank records is called UPRWSES. So it's a mouthful and a very unexciting name, right? And so I was in the government then. What is UPRWS? UP Rural Water and Environmental Sanitation Project. So my team and I, we said, listen, we don't care about the World Bank. We are going to give it a name which will make people in UP and Uttarakhand, at that time it was UP, excited about the project. So one of my officers came up with this brilliant name of Swajal. So it's called the Swajal, even the bank calls it the Swajal project. So I stumbled into the water business by accident. I was the district magistrate in a district called Bijnor in UP. And I was doing one year, we were doing a lot of interesting work. And then sure enough, I fell out with the local politician got transferred. So they sent me back to Lucknow and to a very boring job in the secretariat, in the agriculture production commissioner's branch. So I was a bit frustrated and thinking, you know, I want to be in the field. And then uh, my boss said, listen, this, this World Bank team, 
is, has been coming here for the last three years. This was within three months of my joining. And he said, they're trying to do a rural water project in UP, but somehow nothing has happened. So why don't you, you're coming fresh from the field and you, know, you need something interesting, so why don't you talk to them? So that led to the development of the Swajal project, which was a very interesting community-based project where the community was fully empowered in running the, this scheme, mainly in the hills of UP, which worked quite well. And we tried to do it in the Bundelkhand, which did not work so well, in that part. All about the social capital, the hills of UP, as you know, where there's much more women empowerment, the Chipko movement was there, so there, there's much more social capital there. So they picked up the project. So the Swajal project worked quite well, and I did that for four years, and then I joined the bank. Now, in the World Bank, water is a very major priority. It's one of the 14 uh, global practices. But their water is very broad, right? When I did water, I was looking only at drinking water and sanitation. And I learned very quickly that water is a very, very broad concept. In addition to being at the heart of the climate debate, which is globally relevant today, water in all its sort of wider aspects is very, very broad. And what we like to say in the bank today, there's a very interesting study, but in a sense, if you want to sum up water, it's, there's either too much water, which is flooding, or there's too little, which is droughts, or it's too polluted. And in a sense, that sums up the dilemma and the challenge of water globally. It's an SDG number six, it's a, it's a major goal. So we try to look at water, and in, in, in Government of India, in uh, the second term of the government, we created the Ministry of Jal Shakti. And Jal Shakti brought together my former Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation with Department of Water Resources. So how do you integrate, how do you look at water holistically? And how do you look at integrated water resource management? All the way from the, the resource of water, where the source, you know, and then all the way to service delivery, which is you know, providing water, rural or urban, tap water or otherwise. So this was at the back of the mind of the policymakers in, in the government of India. About two years into my term, in, so about 2017-18, we started thinking about tap water in India. Because if you looked at water was available through hand pumps, shallow hand pumps, India Mark II hand pumps, but the coverage of pipe water supply to households was only 18%. So it was very, very low. Like sanitation was 39%, this was 18%. And all the people working on Jaljeevan Mission. So that's when the genesis of Jaljeevan Mission came up. So how should we take up a major program? Now the dilemma was many states had already taken their own initiatives. For example, Telangana was doing Mission Bhagirat. Other state, Bihar was doing its own program. So the question was, should you do a national program or should you let states take it up? Because water in the end is a state subject. But it was decided that, look, this is an important priority and we should start a centrally sponsored scheme. And of course, uh, the prime minister comes up with these brilliant names and symbols. So Swaj Bharat Mission, Jaljeevan Mission, the PM's name. So the question then was, how do we do this? How do we incentivize states? Some states said, we're already doing this. So you need to compensate us for the work you've already done. You know, it was quite complex. But the idea was primarily to provide some relief, mainly to who are the people who fetch water, who are the people who clean, it's women and girls, who are spending a lot of time in fetching water. So the idea was tap water, right? So Har Ghar Jal is, is the logo for the Jaljeevan mission. And tap water in every house is a massive challenge. So I think some 18 crore households need tap water. Every household needs a connection. So it's 18 crores is 180 million. So staggeringly big ambition. And that's something which Prime Minister Modi is always thinking very, very big, right? And in management jargon, you've heard of the, the bhag, the big, hairy, audacious goal. He throws out very big ideas. And then you follow through with implementation. So how do you do this in five years? Massive challenge. So when we started designing this program, getting into the nitty gritty, it took us about a year to start thinking about this program. One thing we were very clear that, you know, so wherever there would be groundwater, right? And when you say groundwater is clean groundwater, you would rather go in for a groundwater scheme because it's locally available, it's cheaper. 
And wherever you did not have groundwater or it was contaminated, you'd go for a surface water scheme. So the calculation then was that about, about two thirds of the schemes will have groundwater and about one third will need water to come from. Karnataka in particular was a state where you need a lot of surface water schemes because the groundwater has been over exploited to the extent that you know, you've got to go 300 feet and even further down for water. So surface water is a most sustainable option. The question was, what is sustainable? And source sustainability became a big issue. But, and obviously the surface water schemes are more expensive, right? They seem, you know, the per capita cost can go from 10,000 to 30,000, whereas uh, uh, groundwater schemes are typically anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000. So all that was factored in. And so the design of the program was, and then the key concept became something which you may have heard of, and maybe I should ask this question to see how alert is everyone and how much they know about the program. Does anyone know what is an FHTC? Very good. So functioning household tap connection is the term which we came up in some discussions in 17. Because, and every word is significant, right? Having a tap connection, and then I found out it's very interesting. In some states I went, I won't mention the state. They said, sir, we've got a lot of we don't have, we have got uh, HTCs, not FHTCs. So I said, what do you mean by that? They said, tap, nalka hai, lekin pani nahi hai. So that's, you know, that's not an FHTC. So FHTC came into the jargon, and that's what you measure now. It's got to be functional. You need to have 55 LP, CD, and all that other stuff, right? So as we designed this program, the, the scale, and then how do you make sure that the community is involved you set up a Pani Samiti. There are a lot of experiences from Swajal, from Vasmo in Gujarat. And I had an excellent addition secretary, Mr. Bharat Lal, who had worked in Gujarat. So we had a lot of very good people working on the program. Now, they've made phenomenal progress. And the latest numbers, I don't know, I think they've covered more than 70, 75% uh, of coverage. So they've gone from 18% to 70 plus. They're making very good progress. I mean, this is very, very difficult. The scale is much bigger in many ways. The challenges are different, right? So in Swaj Bharat, the challenge was how do you get people to change behavior? And changing behavior is never easy. So the behavior there in Swaj Bharat was going from defecating in the open to using the toilet. And, and that's a habit which is coming in over, which is coming over time. In Jaljeevan Mission, the behavior change was slightly different. Everyone wants clean water, right? So there's no problem or demand for water. It's about usage of water, water conservation. Will you waste water? Will you leave your tap open and running just because you're getting it? Uh, are you getting three hours of supply? So there is behavior change, but it's a different kind. So water conservation behavior, we still don't have in India. So slightly different, but behavior is important. Institutionally, how do you manage this program? So, you know, there's a classic saying in the water business that water is best managed at the lowest appropriate level, whatever that is. So if you have groundwater, if it's a small single village scheme, the community can manage it. Now, how they, what, what's the incentive to manage is different. But if it's a bigger scheme, then it'll be at the district level. If it's a multi-village scheme, then you need some institutional mechanism to manage it. And one of the challenges we have seen globally, and I've worked a lot in China and other countries, what we call post-construction sustainability is a big challenge. Because it's easier to construct, but the maintenance becomes very challenging. And who's going to pay for it? So there's one principle which we applied in Jaljivan Mission, but also globally, which is that the operation and maintenance cost, to the extent affordable, and affordability is important, should be done locally. The communities have to pay. So, and frankly, we found globally that people are willing to pay for good service. If you take, uh, it's more in urban, if you've got to stand in a queue for water and it's coming from a tanker, you're paying a lot of money and you're losing a lot of time. So there's a high opportunity cost for not getting water. So people are quite happy to pay. In China, 20 years ago, I was working. There, there's a county price bureau which determines a price for water per cubic meter. And one renminbi, people were willing to pay a couple of them. So people are willing to pay. If, if they're getting water, they'll pay. Who's going to manage it? 
And we found that in many cases, the rural utility model is the sustainable model. Because in Swajal, it was all about local village water and sanitation committee, VWSC managing. But that's a lot of time on their hands. Like today we were discussing faculty, you guys are teaching, you want to do other work, you don't have time. Your daytime job is your teaching, right? Essentially, and research. Similarly, in rural households or anywhere for that matter, everyone is busy. So to expect communities to come together and spend every evening discussing where do I buy pipes from, who's the handyman, how to fix the repair, it's a, on their own time, it's not, it's not sustainable, right? You can do it maybe once in six months. So in the rural utility model, there could be one village mystery who's hired to operate the plant, you know, switch, switch on the pump and take care of minor repairs, do the water quality monitoring. Now even women are being trained to do water quality. So I think it's very, very important to look at sustainable models of management post-construction. Someone can come and build it. Ideally, you want to be involved with that as well. But who's going to manage it to be dependent? It's a little utopian to think that everyone will come together and run it for free, right? So it's probably more sustainable, like we pay our water bills wherever we live. Someone does it for us and you pay. So I think that model they're trying to do at the local level in the Jaljeevan mission. But it's a very, very ambitious program. And the team which is working on it, and you're, you guys have been in touch with them as part of your JJM chairship, I think that they've done a phenomenal job. Center and states have come together. So it's a partnership. It's a centrally sponsored scheme. It's 50-50 shared basis. A lot of funds have been invested. And I think in many ways, it has uh, transformed the lives of people in rural areas. It's, I think it's, it's a very, very, it's a transformational program at scale. And you know, people around the world are, it's, for them it's mind boggling that you're providing 180 million tap connections with FHTCs and it's not just a tap. Now there will be challenges, there'll be areas where there'll be water quality problems, there'll be construction delays, there'll be all kinds of problems. But I think the ability to uh, function in a transparent way so that funds are transferred directly to beneficiaries, they're registered, the other numbers are there. I think that has made a big difference in this program. And I think without a doubt, and you, have, you can see testimonials from people from the Northeast border villages, I think it's a transformational program to get clean tap water in your house. I think that has, there's no substitute for that. It also incidentally helps in the sustainability of the Swaj Bharat mission. Because many people say without water, how are you sustaining your sanitation? So we would say, fine, the tap water program is coming. You can clean your toilet with you know, half a balti of water, but it's obviously more convenient to have tap water. So in many ways, these programs go together. And uh, I was fortunate to be associated with both. But let me just end with the sort of bigger picture. In the World Bank today, there are eight global challenges which have been identified by our president. Uh, and the World Bank's mission has always been to alleviate poverty. But now we have added, how do you alleviate poverty on a livable planet? Because there are a lot of global challenges and global public goods which need to be, and water is one of them. So water is one of the eight global challenges which have been uh, accepted by the World Bank Group. And again, uh, everyone is looking at the Jaljeevan mission in many ways to get lessons from this which can be implemented in other parts of the world. So it's very different in other countries, right? where you don't have a strong political commitment to scale up basic services, whether it's water, sanitation, financial inclusion, digitization. So that strong political commitment to program it is, I think, one of the major lessons from India. Setting a time frame, which many people think is, is very ambitious, but that's at the core of the implementation of programs. When the political leadership aligns, sets a goal, then people start working towards it. And if, even if it's a stretch target, it becomes something which the time-bound nature of a program is very, very important. And we found that in many ways, that five-year period fits in quite well. You know, it's kind of Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, but it's the right time frame. And maybe it slips by a year or so, but that becomes very, very important. So let me stop there. And and end with uh, an article which I once wrote in the Express, which I called the A, B, C, D, E of implementation. 
So just to make sure about the alertness level in the room and all those here and uh, online. So I'm going to ask if anyone can tell me what do they think this is on delivery of programs. And I'll stop there and happy to take questions. So can anyone guess what is A? So the, each, each one of these letters stands for something. This is on implementing large scale programs. So I thought I'd end on that. What is A? Sorry? Access. Access. No, it's not access. No. Close. Alignment. 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 So align. See, when there is a, a vision from the leader, political or civil, anyone, right? There's, you've got to align. And I had a problem in my ministry when we had the vision, but there were many people who were not aligned. So either they get aligned or you find someone else. So align A. What is B? It's sort of close, but B is, uh, no. Let's see who gets B. No. OK, B is believe. So align is one thing, but many people don't believe, right? You're, you're, you're cynical. You're, it's, it's, you know. So if the team implementing believes, it becomes that much easier. What is C? C is easier. C is communicate. Critical. Look, we were very lucky. And, I don't want to keep talking about it, but we had the prime minister was a communicator in chief. Communication is critical, right? It's not about talking about your program. It's about articulating the program. People need to understand it. Many people don't understand this. So communication, internal, external. What is D? No, D is a little tricky. We actually we used it only because we couldn't find another word. But it's an, it's it's a word which you may not find. So let me, D. It's 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 basically. Correct. It's that spirit, but we use the word democratize. By that we meant you need to take it down locally. So if you, you need to democratize. People need to get feel involved. They need to feel this is my program. It's not some, some politician's program. And so we had villages in Swaj Bharat, big ownership. There was a Gaurav Yatra when they became ODF. So they took pride. We had kids running around in the morning doing Gandhi Giri for people who were still defecating. So they, a sense of excitement. So democratize it. What is E? Empower. Evaluate, someone said? Yeah. E is evaluate. Look, you've got to have evaluation and ideally external, not us. If we keep saying we're doing it, no one believes government, right? So we had WHO, World Bank, UNICEF. We got the agencies with credibility to evaluate. And so that gives you more credit. And what is F? F is only to continue the A, B, C, D, E, F, but yeah. No, so let me, F is follow through, which means sustainability, but S was coming later, so we needed some F. So F is follow through. Look, nothing stops. You know, there was that old ad, the city never sleeps for Citibank. You can't stop. you got to keep working at it because if you stop, then action will stop. So follow through, sustaining, continuing at it till it sticks. So that became very important. So... That was the sort of A, B, C, D, E, F of implementation. But I'll stop there and very happy to take questions or comments or suggestions. Thank you.